A man who built and sold one of the most impactful products in the industry, James Ashford has changed the lives of so many, including me. James has been on the receiving end of phone calls from accountancy firm owners up and down the country going through some of the most traumatic experiences of their entire life. And in this episode, he gives us some harsh truths about the things he's observed from the industry and the way it needs to change. You're going to get so much from this episode, including a little cry from me and James at the end. So welcome to Firm Up Season 2. In the rest of this series, you're going to be getting the mindset and all the practical tips from the best accountants in the entire industry. Enjoy. James, welcome back Thank to you. Firm Up. Pleasure to have you here. So you've recently left Go Proposal. Yes. How did that come about? Um, it was always the plan. The plan was always to build it uh, and then, if it, if possible, to sell it and then to help it to integrate into the company that bought, bought us, which we've done. I'm trying to create some space for myself to figure out what's next. Um, but what I found is that w when I first left, there was just this massive void. Um, and I, I thought it can be brilliant. I've got space. I can spend time with my family. I can do all these things that I wanted to do. And what I realized is I actually like working. I like creating things. I like starting something and finishing it. And I like getting praise from people and saying you've done a good job. All these things that I actually like. Um, and so there was this void. So we, we bought a house last year and um, it's been a, a really big project. And so uh, after about a week of rattling about, I went to the joinery team and said, can I just join your team? I'll do anything you want. Let me just work on the house. Uh, so I built a mezzanine floor in the garage. I built some racking out. I've done some paneling in the bedroom and we've got a cinema room and I'm completing the whole cinema room. And I like about it is that I just like designing something, creating something, working to a high standard, being patient and completing it. And then for Dave to come in and say, you've done a good job there, Jane. That's it. That that ticks my boxes. I remember listening to a, um, a I think it was a Diary of a CEO, ep CEO episode once and Stephen Bartlett was explaining how the big moment, like the big thing that all founders dream of, you sell, the big bell rings and you get all the money that hits your bank account. And he explained it as like, it felt as though you were going up and up and up and then you got to the top of the mountain and it was just nothing. And there was no marching band and no celebration. And actually he felt some of the lowest he's ever felt in his life. Did you experience that? Yeah, the absolute lowest I've ever felt. Not get too far into it, but... I've kind of looked back on it and, and like, why did I feel like that I did? And it's the same analogy in, in that I've always been trying to climb this mountain and you get to the top and there isn't anything beyond it because you've got to where you thought you needed to get to. But it became worse than that in that I then started to look around and look down and thinking, what if I fall? What if I fall from here? What if I lose everything? And I, I got into this real scarcity, panicked mode and what I realize is that I need that challenge. I need to be growing and, and striving towards something. And people talk about, oh, it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. And, and just to caveat this, I wouldn't want it any other way. You, you still got to get to your destination, but it is about the journey. And you've got to find that next thing that's going to push you and evolve you and take you to whatever your next mountain is. Yeah, life is right now. I uh, saw that somewhere the other day. It's like life isn't when you get somewhere. It isn't when you go on the holiday. It isn't when the plane lands. Life, wherever you are right now, this is life. And you have to be grateful and love what you are doing right now. And if you don't, then it's time to change. Yeah. But we don't. That we think I'll be happy when. I'll be happy when I get this amount of money. Or I'll be happy when I have this amount of time. Or when I get that car. Or when I get the six pack or whatever it is. Yesterday, um... I went with Scarlett. What did we have to go and do? We just ran, ran some errands, went and bought some gift vouchers and went to Marks and Spencer's. I, we only ever go to Marks and Spencer's at Christmas. It still feels really fancy to go to Marks and Spencer's and buy nice food, right? Anyway, we went there, went to Costa, and we just had a, a day together. I bought a tech fleece track suit. Track suit. You know what a tech fleece track suit is? It's Bro what the roughly. cool kids wear, right? <laughs> I went in and went to JD Sport and uh, I was with Scarlett and she was laughing. And I said to the girl, it, um, am I too old to have a tech police tracksuit? And she was like, I think you might be actually. And Scarlett was laughing. Anyway, I thought, right, I'm definitely getting one then. So I went and got it and I came out and said, 
do I need a skin fade haircut now? Do I need a buzz cut now? I've got one of these. Um, but anyway, my point being, we just had the best day. Just chatting about nothing and playing about in the car and grabbing a coffee or whatever. And it, and it's, it, it might not seem like much, but it's a real rare moment that, for me, to be there, to be fully there and not doing anything. There was no goal. There was no big thing that we did. And just to be present, fully present with my child and having a laugh. So you've been on this huge, huge journey. What are, I really want to know, so obviously you've gone from very much a bootstrapped, no investment startup founder who everything was done in. I'm going to say like a fear panic mode. You had to bring the customers in to pay the bills to now where you actually probably never have to work a day again in your life. What are some things you wish you knew then that you know now? Would you change anything? I wouldn't change anything because I might not have got to where I got to. Um, and I actually like that bootstrapped part of it all. Um, I, I like the, the the challenge, and you obviously went through it as well with us, um, of, of having to be resourceful and thinking shit, how are we going to get through this? How are we going to figure this bit out? And I think sometimes if you've got more resources, you've got more money, you've got more staff, you've got more time, whatever, you can make lazy decisions and the wrong decisions. And when you haven't got those things, it forces an extra level of creativity to think, right, well, we've only got this number of staff. How can we achieve this? We've only got this marketing budget. How can we dominate the internet for the next week? We've only got whatever. How can we achieve that? And I think it forces the best answers. I watched a really good documentary, uh, the Ronnie O'Sullivan documentary. It's called The Edge of Everything. And he talks, it's about how he's on the edge of fear, the edge of a breakdown, the edge of success. And it's it's this knife edge that you ride in that is the edge of absolutely everything. But that's where the most excitement and, and potential happens. And so it's that feeling of, of entrepreneurship of, it is going right, we are succeeding, but it could also go wrong at any moment and completely collapse. And you you need that. And obviously you want to be on the right side of it and occasionally you fall back the wrong way or fall back into complacency the other way or whatever. And you're trying to maintain that that knife edge. And and since we sold, not even since we sold the business, prior to selling the business when things were comfortable and it was growing, I've not felt that for a while. And then since I've sold it, I've not particularly felt it. The last time I felt it was uh, in November when we took GoProsal to France and uh, we launched my book there and we've started to launch the product there. And it was back to new challenge, new at the foot of a new mountain. And that's what excites me. I don't even know if I answered your question. I don't yeah, know what you your did. question was. I just went off on one about something else. The, the question that I, want, I wanted to get to was, what would you tell yourself five years ago when you started the business? What would you tell yourself now, knowing what you know? And what I'm trying to get at here is we see a lot of gurus, guides, very successful entrepreneurs online, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, wherever you consume your content on YouTube. And quite often the advice that we get given, which is things like be present, enjoy the journey, is advice from someone who's done it. And that's what they're telling you when they've reached the success. But actually... Is that the right advice for someone who's in the thick of it and right at the beginning? Because the way I explain this is like, it's all well and good. Someone who has sold a company for tens of millions of pounds, and this is not what you've just said, but I've listened to a creator talk about this recently. It's all well and good selling a company for tens or hundreds of millions of pounds and then sitting on a podcast and telling someone to be mindful or telling someone to meditate and be grateful for what you've got you can give them that advice right now, but that's not where they are. What they might need is just sheer hard work and hard truths and uncomfortable conversations. And so the question I want to ask you is, looking back on you five or six years ago when you founded Go Proposal, what were some of the most important things that you did, advice that you would give to someone in that same position that you can now look back on in hindsight and say, there was absolutely no chance I would change what happened there. Yeah, it's a really good point. It's easy to look back and say, this is what you, oh, you should be present. But when you're in the thing, you can't be because your head's off. 
for example, you tell the story about Scarlett spending yeah. the day with Scarlett. There was times when you couldn't do that. Yeah. You could that was just physically not possible in your schedule because you were yeah. building a proposal. I think I got I do think I got a good balance with the kids though. I think I was there and, and like if ever there was any event or whatever, I would always try and get back. I would never stay over if I if I couldn't if I could avoid it, I would get back. So I was there when the kids woke up, etc. And I think so physically I think I was very much there and I think I got the balance right. Mentally I wasn't always there. I've convinced myself that the kids didn't know that, but they probably did know that. Um, but I think some of the things that I think held me in good stead was a, a, a permanent sense of paranoia and complete fear that it could all go wrong at any point. Um, I just don't think you can have, you can avoid that or you want to avoid it. You kind of need, you need it and I think it's healthy. And one thing that forced us to do was to move fast, um, faster than anyone can even, they believe is possible and so um that and that but that again comes from a position of fear because of what if i don't get this out the door today what if we don't complete what if we lose a customer so that fear was driving a lot of that and you, you do need it you need you know the book feel the fear and do it anyway but you, you need to keep the fear not fear, feel it you need to actually keep it and and keep going with it you've got to be kind to yourself because you're also a human and you're gonna you're gonna screw up i think the only thing it's advice I'd got and I'd give it back to myself now but I don't even know if I take it but it was some great advice which is um, beware of ghosts I said what do you mean and the guy said you're going to think of everything that's going to it's going to go wrong and they're going to haunt you and you're going to keep thinking but what if this and what if that and when I look back none of them things ha actually happened and all of my fears and concerns were from things I'd made up in my head but then maybe I needed them as well because that helped me to avo you know, avoid certain things the other big bit but i think i did well with this but I, f I feel it even more now it's just i think sometimes you can want to create this front and this illusion that things are better than they are and the moment you do that it takes you away from being fully authentic and, and yourself i think we actually did really well with that like sometimes we made mistakes with the software and or something would break or whatever and we'd always our rule was always be the first to announce it to the, the customers. Don't let them tell you there's something wrong. Go and tell, guys, we've messed up. This is going wrong here. But let me tell you what we're doing to fix it. And so just being completely honest and authentic with everything. No bullshit. Just tell people as it is. Because if you don't, they'll see through it anyway. And I think we did we did really well with that. So I, I don't think I would change anything. I'd just I'd probably give myself just a bit of a hard time and which needed to maybe be a bit kinder to myself and that's I've, I've felt that since now and i'm maybe got some things to heal and just kind of figuring that shit out but something that was really important that you taught me early on is your founding team whatever you want to call them ogs the ogs the first three to ten people that that join your business yep. are going to make or break it they they will make or break the culture they will decide what the standards are. They will be accountable. And you you cannot settle. If you bring someone into that team that isn't right, you cannot settle. You can't allow them to continue to work with you and yeah. potentially be toxic for the culture. Tell us why Why was that so important to you? Because I felt that. It was actually your dad that said to me, says, the thing is, as you grow, your standards will slip. And I say, yeah, if you let it, and I'm not going to let it. And... There is some truth to what you were saying, but you've got to fight against that. That's a force that you're constantly trying to fight against. Um, it was very beneficial. The first member of staff was Jack, um, who I knew. Um, I'd, it worked uh, as like a work placement for a previous business I'd had. I knew him. We were friends. He was a friend of a really good friend of mine. And so when I posted the job, it was like my mate rang me and said, take your advert down. I've got the exact person for you who is it he went jack i went yeah that, you're right let, let's get him and there's something about that which is you want to remove as many unknowns as possible and so in terms of the skills you can teach those but if you if you get in someone that you actually know and you to an extent obviously you never know what someone's real like so you start working with them but if you know them as best you can i would take i would take someone who i know i know the personality i know the character i know the values but this, I don't really know the skill set or the skill set might not be quite right versus taking someone who on paper looks incredible and has all the skills and the provenance and whatever, but they're an unknown entity. I've never worked with them. I don't know how they operate under pressure or whatever. I would take the known 
and work with them rather than the unknown every single time. Um, that was a big part of it. The second one is building systems and processes that remove as much thinking as possible. So if we can automate it, we automate it. If we need, you need a checklist in place, um, we, we do that. Scripts, constant training in those things. And people think that if you do that, but you're going you're gonna to create robots or I'm going to stifle this person's ability. And it's the opposite. If I can remove as much thinking as possible about the mundane, about the day-to-day, -day, I've now freed up their creative potential because they're not sat there thinking, shit, did I send that email? Did I say the right thing on that call? I forgot to send this next. I've taken all, all done. It's all taken care of. Now you can use your creativity to help improve things and develop the business. Um, and one of the big things we did early on was running experiments. So we've set the standard with all this, this structure, firm structure in place. Now you can go and run an experiment this month and try to make this improvement. You've got a theory, let's go and try it and let's expand. And it's about giving brilliant people the space to, to flourish and to grow into, which I think we did really well. And the other big part of it is just not being afraid of having adult conversations with people and not being afraid of saying, and we'd always do it with love and communicating the intention first. I want to keep working with you, you know, forevermore. I want to, us to work together for a long time. I want to be able to reward you. I want to be able to continually increase your salary and, you know, share all your life events with you and help to pay for those with the work, the money that you're earning from us. But the way that you've been behaving in this last week is absolutely unacceptable. And the work, like the work, quality of work you've been doing is shit. This has to change. It has to change now. I'm not going to put up with it for one more week. And if I have to sit down with you again in a week's time, it'll be to sack you. Do you understand how this needs to change? And pe people hear that and they think it's, you can't say that to people or what if you can't handle that? If you can't handle that, that's, your, that's not my problem. That's your problem that you've got to go and deal with. And if this is going to be the bump in the road that's going to derail us and it means you're going to leave, well, we've gone as far as we're going to get and that's that and I'm all right with that. And here's the other thing as well is it's not that I dislike you. It's not that I've fallen out with you. I hate you, whatever. But what you your behavior or the quality of this is not acceptable and I'm not going to put up with it. And I'm also not afraid of you going. If you need to go, crack on. I'll help, I'll help you. I'll help you find another job. It's not a problem. But you can only do that once you're confident in yourself and you're confident in your processes and your system so I could take another person and train them up very quickly and bring them into that role if you've got a brilliant recruitment process you know all these other things I'm confident that if I need to get rid of you I, I will get rid of you and I'll replace you and that seems really really harsh for people to hear but if you can't get to that you put yourself in a very difficult position because you keep everyone that you hire you keep everyone and your standards will slip because you know that I can't get rid of you so you can be a dick or you can drop the standards or whatever, and you know that I'm afraid to get rid of you because I can't replace you. It takes me too long to train someone up. Um, and also, this is the other thing. If you don't systemize everything, you need the system to run the business and you're running the system, right? If there's no system and you're just doing great things, seemingly great things, I'm now even more afraid to get rid of you because I can't replace you because everything's in your head. And that's why it needs to be out in a playbook as best it can be Obviously, I'm going to lose something if I lost you because there will be some magic there that you bring to the party as well. But you've got to be in a position where you can make that break if you need to. And being the second member of staff in Go Proposal, I saw just the second person sat in the office and we already had scripts for every phone call. The CRM system was super slick. We had nurture sequences for emails that were constantly selling to people while we were asleep. And I was staff member number two, like you weren't a huge corporation at this point. So anyone listening to this who's really early on in business, just because there's only one, two or three people doesn't mean it's not time to systemize. No. It's the perfect time. I had all those things in place for me. It was only me that was running it to start with. There was no Jack. There was just me, uh, an external developer. And we were, I, I was doing the marketing. I created the content on the website. I'd do the post, do the email. And then people would sign up and I would call them and welcome them and I would handle all of their support requests and I would just do, I was doing all, spinning every single plate. But also I knew that I needed people to replace me. 
So as I was doing that, I was writing the script. I was writing out what I was saying to people. I was building out the email sequences, uh, creating checklists for what I would do when someone would sign up and my setup process, etc. Creating videos to remind myself that as soon as that next person come, was coming in, which I knew that would happen when I got to a certain amount of money that I could afford to pay for them, then straight away I could say, right, that's the process for how this part runs, crack on, and then we'll, we'll move on to the next part. And then you, when you came, I think that one of the first things you started to do was to start to prize the marketing away from my vice-like grip because nobody can possibly do the marketing as well as me. And you were like, yeah, but just show me, just teach me, just no. And then eventually, bit by bit, you took it and it's not, no disrespect, it's not to say that it was at my standard straight away, but you were like, right, how can I make it better? How can I make it better? And had we not got it away, you then couldn't build it up to get it back to the level again. And then you were in a position to bring other people in, say, right, now we need a marketing manager, social media manager, a copywriter, a videographer, et cetera, to start to build that team. So you could then back heel all of those components and move into your next role. I think one of the greatest traits of employee, founder, just anyone who is in a position in life where they want to succeed and be a high achiever and high performer is to be coachable. And I knew at that moment I wanted to do marketing. I knew I had the drive for it and the skills somewhere within me that needed nurturing. But I knew you were better and all I thought was, I'm just going to keep taking the shit. I'm going to keep putting videos out. I'm going to keep making newsletters. I'm going to keep writing emails. And you're going to keep passing them back to me and telling me what's wrong and keep passing them back, telling me what's wrong until we get to a point where you go, actually, yeah, that's there's nothing wrong there. And then one day you go, God, that's better than I could have done. Yeah. And then I get to pass that on to somebody else as long as all those learnings are put back into the systems and processes. Was that word coachable, and you, you explained it correctly there, but there's just another part to it as well, is you're absolutely right. It's the coachable trait. So if I see a... So I've got a few business owners just as friends, really, that I just help. Um, but all of them, they're all coachable. And what coachable means is that are you prepared to accept that your current thinking is wrong? That's, that's what it ultimately means. Because your ego is going to flare up and say, no, no, I'm right, blah, blah, blah. But there's another bit to it, which is it's not just that your thinking is wrong. It's that it's always been wrong. So you think that this standard is acceptable. Yet, yeah, and you've always thought that, or you know, you've had that thinking for a period of time. Yeah, and that was always wrong. So you've got to accept that not only am I wrong now, I've always been wrong, and I'm prepared to change it. And we've always had this thing, which is it's not about who's right, but about what's right. And then you then, as you evolved, got to points where you would challenge me back and say, Yeah, but actually this is how this should be done. I'm like, oh shit, yeah, yeah whether it's to do with recruitment or, you know, you say we need this member of staff next. I'm like, yeah, I don't think we need that. Yeah, we do because of these reasons. So you have to be coachable. You, I don't think you can coach unless you're coachable yourself because it has to come back to you at some point. Yeah, I find it's the same with the, the tough adult conversations that you spoke about. Whenever anyone asks me, how do I, I want to start having these conversations. I don't know where to start. I feel really scared. The first thing I tell them to do is go and get some go and ask for some feedback like go out to your team or go to a peer in your team and just say I need you to give me some difficult feedback this week I don't want you to sugarcoat it I need you to come and lay it straight on me because you need to know what your response to that feedback is and if your response is blame no you're wrong go back there's something wrong with you you're not ready to start giving feedback yet you need to go back and do some work inside yourself to understand why your ego is so high and you've built so many walls up. But if your response to that feedback is, it's going to hurt, like there's no denying feedback, negative feedback always hurts. You wouldn't be human if it didn't. But you allow it to hurt you. You go away and do some work and think, right, where do we need to fix? And then weeks later, months later, you're an entirely new grown person because you've taken on that feedback and you've grown as a result. When you can do that, and now you will see, you will not only be confident in yourself giving this difficult feedback, you will be able to see what a positive impact it has on people. So it'll stop you being so scared to have the conversations because you stop caring about hurting them in the short term because you will see what it will unlock in yeah. the long term. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. I think something else you can do with that as well is, I've been thinking of this for a while, is um, another great practice ground. And it's actually more than a practice ground because it's the ultimate 
fighting ground or whatever it is, is to go and have that conversation with your wife or with your husband or with your kids or your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your mum or your dad. Um, and I read a quote recently, which is like, who's controlling you? The person who's controlling you is the person you don't criticize, right? Which is an interesting point. So the most difficult conversation I can ever have with anyone, I've had a difficult conversation with my parents over the years. I've done that one. I'm cool with having it with my kids. I'm, I parent my kids. I'm not the friend. I will be friendly, but I'm their parent first and foremost, right? So I'm all right parenting them. I don't mind telling them. I don't mind. I'll take the phone off them. I don't give a shit. I'll t I don't, you can fall out of me. You can be upset with me. You can tell me you hate me. I don't care. I'm going to parent you. The hardest conversation I ever have to have is with Becky. If something's happened that she doesn't seem to have a problem with having the conversation with me, by the way, <laughs> but I find it harder to have it with her, where something's happened and you need to say, I don't like it when you say that, or I don't like this, or this is how you're making me feel when you're doing this. Because I'm, and it's hard to say that because we could now get into an argument. We could fall out, you know, or the worst thing could happen is she could say, I'm leaving you. You know, that's the, the ultimate fear, isn't it? That the person you love the most that you want to spend your life with is now going to say that, well, if you can't accept that, I'm off. And then you have to have a real adult conversation, right? It's easy to have it with your parents because like... You I know, don't think it is. Don't you think? No. But they're your family, you know? So it's like your dad, my brother. Yeah. I can have, and it's rare I've ever had to have these, but we can have adult conversations and tell each other quite aggressively. But the crack is, it's very, very rare. And the next day, it's like, we're all right. We're all good. Yeah, we're all good now. We've got it out of the way, right? So maybe brothers and sisters, it's easier. But with life, parents, it's hard. But with life partners, it's hard. So my thinking is, is that's your practice ground. And it's actually probably the most important place to do it. You need to get your life right at home first. If there's things that your partners, that, you know. But likewise, you have to invite the question back. Where am I falling down as a part of you where am i not showing you enough love how am i not showing you love in the right way what is upsetting you you have to have that question back once you've done it there having it with a client's a piece of piss because you, it's like well i'm not afraid i'm i'm a, i'm a prepared to have this adult conversation with my life partner and know that the consequence could be that this person leaves me if it's if she absolutely hates what i'm saying right once you've done that it's like well i'll have a conversation with a client i'm not bothered anymore because we're ultimately scared of the breakup. When we yeah. say we don't want to have the difficult conversations with yeah. clients or team members, you are scared of the breakup still. It's not just that you're scared. It's that um, your neural, entire neurological system is hardwired to be, for you to be fearful because the most primitive part of your reptilian brain knows that you need to stay part of the tribe, by the fire, under the shelter, near the food, and not be kicked out of the tribe because you're going to be eaten by a saber-toothed tiger. That's the most primitive part of your brain. Your brain is not designed to make you successful or rich or, you know, that's not what your brain's job is. Your brain is to stop you being eaten. And so you're always on high alert. We're, we're, we're hardwired to, to, to feel that fear. And so what this boils down to is fear of rejection. And so it's, you're fighting against a very, very primitive urge, which is to be on your own and to potentially experience rejection and not only that to make it all worse we've all experienced rejection in our life you know whether it's parents that have divorced or whether it was a partner that dumped you or whether someone died and left you that was a form of rejection all of these things are wounds that we we won't properly heal because we won't have had the maturity at that time in our life to understand it or why it was happening and so it it just gets encoded into our body as a physical feeling that's unresolved. Then we carry on. Then all of a sudden I've got this client who's saying that, well, if you increase my fees or if you tell me what the crack is or this member of staff that I'm going to leave, it's like poking this wound. That, oh my God, it feels 10 times worse than it actually is because it's just dug up. Every rejection you've ever had in your life and you're so afraid of having that feeling again, having to deal with it or being on your own. Jesus got heavy quick, didn't it? <laughs> but that's the truth. That's, and, and, but you know what? If you don't have this type of conversation, if people don't understand that, they'll continue in behaving in certain ways and have no understanding as to why they're reacting or overreacting. Because people don't, we don't have counselling. We don't have people who help us to understand our brains. You'll go to, your, you go to a personal trainer and they'll show you why you're not lifting right or you'll go to a nutritionalist and they'll explain that you're not eating properly. 
but you don't go to a, a counselor or a psychotherapist people rarely do and sit down with them and saying i keep having this strong feeling about this situation i'm really afraid of this can you help me to kind of unravel it and understand what's going on i have i i have i'm still i still have counseling now and i find it the most indulgent thing that i invest in every single week to help me to understand my feelings towards the outside world let's bring this on to firms and see bookkeeping firms you have spent more time than probably i would argue anyone on the face of the earth working alongside accountancy business owners in their offices on calls you've taken upset phone calls crying phone calls people on the brink of divorce suicide breakups everything you have from accountancy firms you have seen it all and right at the beginning of when when you joined the industry no one would listen to you you weren't accepted you weren't brought into the tribe you were rejected by the tribe but now You've done your hours in the industry and you have seen it all. Big question. What's your take on what these incredible business owners, but scared and fearful business owners, what's your take on what they need to wake up to and realize that you've seen from, from an outsider, but very much in the weeds perspective? Yeah. So, so I've experienced them things of, of, accountancy firm owners or CEOs of very large firms, top 100 firms, and of small firms and of armies of one in this country, in other countries. Uh, and I have had phone calls of people rang me in, in tears on the brink of divorce, on the brink of suicide. But literally, you know, the uh, and uh, as GoPro's Lavot, it seems like extreme that people can think I've had these conversations. I have had them, and, and many of them. I would speak for the last five, seven years, I've spoken to an accountant every single day either they've contacted me or i've contacted them for, for yesterday right so i'm on a sabbatical at the moment i called helen bauer yesterday because she did a post on uh, linkedin saying that she had a secret santa and she was given a cup with my face on and saying that she's the number one fan and a pen and uh, she posted it so i was i was with scarlet yesterday we we're in starbucks and i show as we were sat in the queue waiting i showed scarlet the picture uh, that helen had posted just as so she knows that I'm a big deal <laughs> among a small number of accountants, right? And uh, I said, would it be funny if we rang her, right? So I looked through and my emails to find when she signed up, because when you sign up for your proposal, you have to put your, your phone number in it. And I thought, I wonder if she put a mobile number in. And I found a phone number. And uh, so I rang her and it must have popped, you know, it pops up on your iPhone. And it says, uh, this may be James Ashford. So it, it come up, it may be James Ashford. And a member of staff answered it because she was on the phone and went, you need to end your call. It's James Ashford <laughs> on the call. So she ended the call. And uh, we just had a, a great chat and uh, talked about things and a new website and gave us some advice and various things. And so over the years, I've had very intimate conversations. I've had, I've got drunk with them, which I'm not saying that to be proud or to promote uh, drinking to excess. But when you've had a few pints with people, you get to see the truth. You get to hear the truth behind things. You know, I don't think surveys or focus groups get the truth out of people i've i've got to the truth of people over the years and i've seen lots of challenges and it's it's frustrating and sometimes and, and saddening other times because the thing that i've really and this is completely genuine is that the overwhelming feeling i get from these accountancy firm owners or people in senior positions in accountancy firms is they're really good people really nice people really kind want to do well, want to do good for their clients, trying to build a business and create their life for themselves, etc. Yet, it's they find it really hard, and it is hard. And technology improves that supposedly, supposedly makes accounting easier, yet it doesn't feel any easier for them at all, which makes them doubt themselves more because they're like, shit, we, we bought all the tech, we did all these things, and it's still really hard what's going on. So... In answer to your question, what is their actual problem? I don't think there's any one answer. There's no magic bullet to to solve to solve in it. I think a few themes is, if I'm dead honest, I don't think that firms, many firms, do enough for their clients. I'm just pissed off everyone listening to this now. It's like, what do you mean I don't do enough? I've been working till 10 o'clock last night. We're doing tax returns until the end of January. Of course we do enough. 
don't mean it in that respect. What I mean is you, people do lots for lots of different clients, but what they should be doing is going deeper with a smaller number of clients and doing more for them. The, the clients that desperately need more from them and they're just afraid to go into it. I was with a friend of mine who's got a great business yesterday and they don't, they don't, they, he gets a monthly management report, but they don't have monthly management meetings. He, and I looked at it and it was black and white. And I said, a black and white document can't actually work. I need to see things with red and green on it to know what's out of balance and what's in, you know, to know what I should be focusing on. And are you having to interpret this or are they interpreting it for you? Oh, I have to interpret it. Well, what are you looking at? So I'll just look to see whether my profit's right or not and whether I'm making enough money. I'm like, yeah, but what about, the, how do you know that you're not spending enough on recruitment this month because you should have employed that next member of staff by this point and you've not, you're not employed them yet. And it, so it looks good on paper because you're making more money than you should be. But you that mon your recruitment bill should be going up this month because you should have recruited that person. These numbers are clues to things that are or are not happening in the business and you're not getting that information. I said, how much are you spending with your accountant? He said, about two grand a month. So it's not enough. You should be spending three, four thousand pounds a month and they need to be doing more for you. Let me come with you to sit with the accountant and show them what they should be doing with you, right? But I know that it'll be one of their biggest clients. Um, yet they're still not doing enough. And I need to kind of break it down to say, and he was like, I need to spend more. You need to spend more. You should be wanting to spend more. And the accountant, you should need to be doing more and charging more. Like, let's understand, let's have a, a, a different, they need an adult conversation with each other. Where Do you know where he's trying to get to? Do you know the problem he has in trying to interpret this, this shit document that he's sending him every month? It needs to be, you know, looked at, you need to understand what the metrics are that he's trying to improve and you should be reporting on that. And you haven't got a forecast for the year and like, oof. Anyway, my point is, is they're not doing it. They're not doing enough. And they're probably not doing enough because they are too busy working with clients they shouldn't be working with. But they're afraid to go and have that conversation with this person and saying, we need to be charging you two, three, four, five thousand 5,000 pounds a month and doing so much more for you. And the other thing is, what they're doing isn't good enough. That report is not good enough. They think they've done a good job because they've done his bookkeeping, they've balanced everything, and the system has spat out a report. And that report is a piece of shit because it gives them no information. He cannot make any decisions off this at all. And also, his senior people in his company, they they don't even see it because it's no use to them, right? So the, the information that's coming out is not useful and the the whole thing is broken. And I said I said to him, having run a business and owned a business that got this right, I, I said to him, this will take you months and months to get right, even with me in your corner trying to help you to figure this out. It's not easy, is it? We, you think our monthly management meetings, it took months and months. of get, If you do monthly management meetings for a year, you've only got 12 attempts at it, right? It won't be right on month one. So the next month it has to get better. And the next month it has to get better again. So you've only got 12 attempts to improve it over the course of a year. And it still probably won't be where you want it to be. So they don't do enough. They're afraid to have these conversations and, and really dig in. What they're afraid of is the unknown. Okay. I've never been afraid of the unknown. So what they're afraid of is they know bookkeeping. They know payroll. They know how to produce this monthly management. They know how to reconcile double entry bookkeeping, all this shit, right? I don't understand any of that, but they know that. To move into what I'm just talking about there, which is what is the information that you actually need? Where are you trying to get to in your business? How much time is it taking you to focus on this? Why are your staff not being brought into this? What could they actually be owning in regards to this? What's your highest value activity that you could be focusing on each month? How could we help you to get into that? And I don't know the answers to any of that stuff, but I'm comfortable with the unknown. So I know that I am needed. I need to sit with him and his accountant and help to thrash this out. And, he, and I said to him, I don't, even though I've done this, I don't know the answers for you. And it'll take us four months for us to get onto the starting blocks just to try and think what do we need, yeah? And it'll take us another 12 months to get it right accountants are scared of having that conversation because they feel they would have to get it right to start with and they're scared of moving into that unknown thing. So 
the moment they feel unknown, right, come back quick, let me go do some bookkeeping, let me reconcile this, because that's where I feel safe, yeah? So they, they have to feel comfortable with that. They have to be prepared to look at themselves and say that what I'm doing isn't good enough. This report is crap. The onboarding of that client, the experience of that onboarding process was terrible. How can we improve it? They dare look at themselves and, and want to make that improvement. Because of those two factors, what they're doing isn't good enough and they're not doing enough for their customer. So they dare increase their fees. So they get stuck in this position. And the final thing, and I see this repeated more times. Let me tell you what I wish I could do. Right? I don't know what you're editing out of here. I don't know how many beeps you can be putting on what I'm saying here today, but I'm not bothered. I'm just going to tell you the truth. Nearly every single accountancy firm I've ever been in, and I get brought in with a big group of people, whether it's all of their partners, all of their senior team, all of whatever, I could solve the majority of their problems with an opening statement, okay? So we, I don't care what they tell me their problem is, whether it's marketing, we're struggling to outsource to India, we've, uh, we're not able to charge enough, we're not able to get our um, tax returns complete in time, I'm not bothered what your problem is, I could solve it with this question. I would go around and I would give everyone a post-it note and I would say, there is one person in this room that is messing it up for everyone. They're not on board with what we're doing. And in fact, they're actually pushing back against us. They're the person that says, yeah, but. And a yeah, but is a no in disguise. Someone who says they're 95% on board with what you're trying to do might as well be 0% on board. Because someone who says they're 95% on board wants to give the illusion the illusion to everyone that they're on board, but they're not, they're actively corroding this. And I've, we experienced it in our own accountancy firm and I've experienced it in every other accountancy firm that I have been in, that there's one person that is the most corrosive person in that room and they'll be affecting other people around them. And so all put your name, who you think this person is on the post-it note and whoever gets the most votes, we're going to sack them. And if you did that in every single accountancy firm, as harsh as that is, I promise you their business would improve instantly. But full disclosure, please get a HR advisor before you take that advice. Yeah, of course check with HR. But I'm just going to, I am not affiliated to any company at this point. So I am not saying that what is right or what is wrong, what you shouldn't do. But I, I do just say this very honestly to people. At the end of the day, this is your business. You've got to get this right for you. And no one cares as much about this business as you. And yes, there are. Um, legalities around removing a member of staff, especially if they've been with you to, you know, more than two years, there's, there's processes to go through. But I'm just going to take you to the fact, and I've seen this happen in businesses and big businesses, you can still get rid of somebody. If you've got someone who's been with you for four years, five years, or whatever, this is the fact, you could get rid of that person today. You could say, you've never documented it, you've never said anything to them, I'm sick of this, I know that you're the problem, I'm getting rid of you. Why? I just I feel it in my gut. You're the wrong person. I've got to get rid of you. Legally, that might cause you some issues. But factually, you could do that. You might get taken to tribunal. You might have a, a fine to pay. You might have to pay some cash out. But you can still do it. And so I'm just saying that. I'm not saying that you should do it. Go and speak to your solicitor. Go and get you get your advice. It's your business. You've got to make the decision at the end of the day. But what I want you to know is that it's possible. There is actually a way that you can do it when when I talk to people about this, there's a way that you can do that and still actually be very kind to the employee because there's an argument to say everything is your fault. So even if you've got a toxic employee who's ruining your culture, you, you hired them, them yeah. you kept them, you accepted the standards for however many years. So that's your problem to yeah. deal with. So it's actually quite unfair for you to turn around and get rid of them but what would be fair is turn around and get rid of them, tell them exactly why and say, I'm going to actually pay you for six more weeks or pay you for two more months whilst you find another job. I cannot afford to have you in my business because you are ruining it from the inside, but I can afford to continue paying your salary, but you're going to be nowhere near the business. So that's, Absolutely. and we've done that in the past. We did that with two employees early on. We paid them for two months. Um, they hadn't been with us two years, but we paid them for two months because we said, I understand, we've let this go on too long. We, This is my fault. I have yeah. allowed this to continue. But we cannot accept this behavior for one more minute in the company. So we're letting you go right now. But we're going to pay you for two more months. So I don't yeah. want you to, you know, I don't want you to go home panicking that you've got a family to support that you can't. Um, so there's that you can do as well. And then people are like, yeah, but then I'm going to be paying for, re paying for 
t- money for resource I don't have. What's worse? What is worse? Because you, by avoiding all these uncomfortable scenarios in your life, you are pushing and pushing and pushing and they will not go away. They will just be denser. They'll be harder to navigate just later on in life. And by then, you've been paying them for years and they've probably intoxicated the, every single person in your team. Yeah. You'll know, I always think there's a good test um, is to, you know, everyone jokes about like when the marketing team or the marketing people want to make a TikTok and they say, oh, when the marketing team want to make a TikTok, everyone like puts their heads down. They're like, oh, for God's sake, I don't want to do this. See who does that. See who, when the marketing team goes to the team and says, guys, we want to make TikTok, who gets excited at the thought of doing something a bit fun that might help the company in a different way Yeah. and see who goes, no, F that, I'm not, not doing that, not getting involved in that. That's your problem. Yeah. That's your person who is basically saying, I don't value your job. I don't value the fact that you, because people still see TikTok and marketing as like this fluffy thing. They're saying, I don't value that. What I'm doing is more important and how dare you ask me to get involved yeah. in something like that. It's okay if people are uncomfortable being on camera and they're accountant, I understand that, but it's very different to like grumbling and go, no, I'm not doing it. Yeah. So that, I always think that's a really good test of, because you will actually find your bright sparks there as well. Because there'll be people who jump up and go, fine, come on then, let's do it. And they might feel a bit uncomfortable, but they'll do it anyway. And we saw that early on. And, and it was how we, you can't fire someone on that, but it's how you can spot. Yeah who is a problem like who's causing these little problems yeah and the tr- and the reality is, is they even if, if they were to be honest with themselves they don't want to be there either but they've just not had the bravery to, to leave because they've just got too comfortable with getting the, the cash and so you're actually releasing them to go and find something like so it's to say to them, look i can only explain your behavior towards our company or towards me as that if you're honest with them, you don't want to be here you know but obviously it's a leap for you to go and leave and find another job so i'm going to help you and when you said paying for six weeks, depending on how long they've been there, it might be the only paying for six months or 12 months, right? And I, this is where this has shown up for me. I've gone and spent, I had a day with a, an accountancy firm this year and they, they asked me to go and see them. They were, they were struggling. So I went with the two directors and went and had lunch with them. We spent hours together. And all they talked about was this member of staff. And I have had this happen three times this year, right? When I was focused on this one example, three times, same thing. And people talk about time and money, right? But what people don't talk about is energy. And I said, at the end of the article, I was there, I was unable to spend like maybe two or three hours with them. At the end of the time, I said, I just need you to know you've spent three hours talking to me about this person. All this time and all your energy has been expelled. I can see in your body language how you're feeling about this. You've spent, we haven't spent this time talking about how you could grow your business, how you could make more money, how you could attract new customers, which you could have done. You spent this time being annoyed with this person. And not only that, if you've been doing that to me, I know that when you walk out through your door at night time, you'll be saying the same things to your loved ones. When you're on the phone to your friends, you'll be saying the same things there. The amount of energy this expels and takes from you is ridiculous. And you could be reusing that energy into something that's growth oriented and moving you forward, but you're not, you're just keeping stuck here. And so you then get rid of them because you think you're going to have to pay him 10 grand to leave, let's say. Gee, how much, like, you've just, I could have shown you how to make 10 grand more in the three hours we've been sat here if you'd have reinvested that time and energy into something constructive, yeah? So stop using money as the factor that's that's driving these decisions because you've got two other factors to consider time and energy, and we can always make more money, but you're running out of time and you're running out of energy, and they're the things you're neglecting. Going back, I just want to ask quite a practical question on offering more service level, offering more for your clients. So say I'm a three-person accountancy business, humble but strong, and I have got, I don't know, three, four hundred clients, and I'm convinced most of them are paying me way too little. And I'm, yeah, I'm actually pretty sure now that I'm probably not giving them the best service I can. Where do I start? A very practical uh, tool to do to use to get an understanding of whether people are under investing in the finance function which is what we're talking about here is just a, a theory um and you can justify this in many different ways but it's that companies should be investing between two and three percent of their rep well e- 
even up to more than like two to four or to five percent potentially of their revenue into the finance function of their business. And you could do some analysis yourself of this. You could look because you probably have got some clients that you're doing a lot for or that are investing at a good level. What percentage are they investing? And there's also an argument to say that as you're a smaller business, you'd be investing near a five percent, and as it grows, it can maybe drop a little bit. Um, and what this is, what that theory is based on, is that if you was to go and employ a finance director, a financial controller, a bookkeeper, or whatever, a payroll clerk yourself how many days a week would you need them people and, and what would that cost to go and employ those people well you're actually providing that level of service over here and it's a you know around the clock service etc so a good analysis to do is to get a list of all of your clients a list of with what their revenue is what they're currently spending with you and what that is as a percentage of their revenue i'm about to just do the math here quickly but let's say, for example, you want a client to be spending a thousand pound a month with you. That's that's a good client, or above a thousand pound. So if you've got a client that does half a million pound in revenue, yeah, and let's say we take the average of three percent, so uh, half a million pound uh, revenue client, three um, percent of that is fifteen thousand pounds. So they should be spending fifteen thousand pound a year with you, which works out at twelve hundred and fifty pound a year, uh, twelve hundred and fifty pound a month. Sorry. So if that's your dream client, you know, just think about it. Would you rather have one client paying you two grand a month or 20 clients paying you a hundred quid a month? I'd want the one client spending two grand a month because I can go deeper. It's more impactful. It's more enjoyable. I don't have to pick up their file as often. There's more no, it's more of a known entity, et cetera. So I would say that's more of a sweet spot to be working with. Um, but if you know that they're the type of clients you want, you can quickly say, well, who are my clients that have half a million pound? Because if they don't have half a million pound revenue or 400,000 pound in revenue, they can't spend a thousand pound a month with you effectively. You know, so you've got to decide what is what is your sweet spot. Is it 300,000 pound revenue clients up to 5 million? Is it? Is that the your sweet spot or whatever up to a million? I don't know. And then to be figuring out what they're currently spending with you and to identify those opportunities if you've got a half a million pound revenue client and they're spending 500 pound a month with you, I know I can get them to 1,250 quid. And, I sh and not only that, I can do, I should be. They're not investing enough. There's more I can be doing for that person. And so that's just a very analytical tool of identifying those opportunities. And then what you can do is just run some maths, do some scenario planning and say, right, and here's a good question to ask yourself before you do this. If we just bought this business today, what decisions should we make? And the reason for asking that question is it's to try and create some emotional detachment with the current clients that you've got. So you could look at those clients and say, right, well, if that block there, we could double their fees, I could get rid of that third of client, a third of our clients, then bottom clients we could get rid of who are never going to spend any more with us. They don't like us, they're a pain in the backside. They never do what we want. We can get rid of those and we would still be making more money and it would free up our time and our energy. So I think that's just a good, a good place start that would that accountants would feel comfortable with it's like an analytical tool they could use what about if someone's got you got to get someone's fee up from 300 quid to 1500 quid or 300 quid to a grand but if you start losing all these clients how do you pay the bills yeah and that's the fear what if i start losing all of the clients we become extreme and black and white in our thinking you're, you're not gonna lose all the clients and it's not that you're going to send an email out to all your clients in one go saying your fees are tripling or whatever it's a slow process you take three clients at a time and you would move forward with them, make a decision, move forward again. And it it really depends. I've written about this. I've got enough videos and there's enough webinars out there where I go into the specifics of how to do this. It will be rarely just a case of increasing fees. It'll be increasing service level as well. So having that different conversation with them to make sure that you're doing everything you can for them. It's not about trying to take them from here to here. It's to say, this is everything that we need to be doing for you. You're not you are not being fair. You are being selfish if you don't at least offer everything that that client needs from you. They don't have to accept it, but you have to go and present it. So normally a fee increase will be a combination of you doing more for them and you charging more for what you've already been doing as well. There is a fear here that we avoid, which is maybe you're not good enough. Maybe your service level isn't good enough. And I think you talked about this before with a, the webinar with Stuart Hurst recently, where if that's the case where you need to increase the fee, but your service level has been terrible, then what you can say is, 
which I think it was that exact example to go for 300 to 1500 pounds a month this is what you need to be spending this is what you need to be spending with us for what you're getting this is where it needs to be I appreciate and I will hold our hands up to the fact that our service level has fallen short of that so what we're going to do for the next quarter is we're going to be providing you that 1500 pound a month of service for the 300 pounds so you can experience what that is and if you agree that we're now at that point in three months time we're going to be moving you up to that fee and if you're unhappy with that then we can part part ways so again it's just about being honest you know we're all just trying to do our best and th the moment you try and bullshit a client they'll see right through it but if you can just have that honest conversation with people not by email by phone better but in person face to face even better go and have that difficult what seems like a difficult conversation and it's to say i really value this relationship i want to keep working with you i, I want to help you to grow your business i want to celebrate in all of your successes but i'm not being fair to you or to this relationship by allowing you to keep spending what you're spending because it's just not sustainable so the only way we can preserve this relationship um is by us increasing your fee i will fully hold our hands up we have fallen short of what your expectations have been lately so i want you to be able to give us a chance to to show you that and to meet us halfway with it but this is where i need to get you to and just before we wrap this up the last thing i want to touch on is taking action i now work in a coaching capacity training capacity for lots of i work with quite a few accountancy firm owners i work with other business owners and one of the big one of the biggest reasons the biggest gaps between the best of the best who are flying, growing, getting huge wins and those who are staying stuck is the action that they're taking. It's not the fact that they're invested in a coach. It's not the fact that they're listening to this podcast now and they follow your teachings and they've read all the books. The thing that will make their business stand out from all the rest is when they actually go and take action. And with repricing, how that looks is not accepting that the first and it's the same with when you make videos and put videos online when you do the first one it is going to be shit the first time you have a really difficult conversation with a client you're going to go in there with shaking hands you're going to be nervous you're going to be sweating you're going to be scared you're probably going to mess it up a little bit and there is more chance that they will leave because you're going to be so less confident in what you can deliver the tenth time you do that will be an entirely different story you will be feeling so confident you'll have edited your script your body language you will just you'll know exactly what to sell how things hit but you can never get to that 10th time if you don't do it the first time and you do it badly and people get stuck they get stuck because they think i'm not confident enough to have this conversation so they keep listening to the podcast they keep reading the books to try and find the answers you have all the answers everything you know you need to do already exists within your brain especially after listening to this podcast episode the only thing left to do is take the action even if you do it badly and that's where I want to end because I know you finish a lot of your talks I've seen you talk tens if not hundreds of times now and you always drill that point into people and I've seen it so clearly I've seen it in action when people don't do anything it's, it's paralysis of paralysis, like decision paralysis. So just that's where I want to end. Go on, follow on, follow on from that and tell us how and when you've seen action. You've you got to know why you're doing it. you got to know why. The thing I always say to firms, kind of normally off the record, quietly, is look, when you, if it, let's say you're a firm owner and I'll say to you, look, at the end of the day, when you lock your house at night and you kiss your kids or your wife or your husband or your dog or your teddy bear, good night or whatever, no one's thinking about you. I'm sorry, no one's thinking about you. And that world that you've created for yourself with the things that you've got around you, with the feelings that you've got, um, that's your world. And, and this is what you've got to get right and what you've got to focus on, you know. And the entire reason for your business is to give you that world that you want. And you've got to be at the center of this. And it's not selfish. It's, it's absolutely the right thing to do because that's what your client should be doing as well. If you can't get it right, you can't be advising them about what the right thing to do is. You've got to get it right for yourself. Get it right at home there. And your business should be giving you the life that, that you want. Your client should not be the center of the world. You should be your center of your world. Your team should be the next layer. And then your client should be the third layer. That's the that's the order it, it should be in. 
And so you've got to remind yourself as to why you're doing this because that will get you through things. And then it is, to your point exactly, like I'll coach people on how to produce videos and I'll show them how to do it. But I explained, look, your first 100 videos is going to be shit, but that 101st one is going to be a banger. So let's just get through them first ones fast, right? Same with this. Repricing your clients, your first 10 are going to be horrible, okay? That 11th is going to be mega. So let's just get through them first 10 quick and not stress it. We're just trying to improve. That's all. You, we're not seeking for perfection. We're seeking for progress. And what you've got to do is force the action. Just take the first step, right? So it could be, so you found the client that you're going to reprice, email them and say, I need to have a meeting with you before the end of the year. That's it. You've no, At that moment, you might have no way of doing it. You don't know what to say to them. You don't know how much you'll be increasing the fees by. Just say it. Do you remember a few years ago, there were people struggling to increase their fees. And I said, right, I'll take 50 firms on and I'll show you how to increase your revenue. I can't remember it's how much I said by. the spring forward challenges. Yeah, the spring forward yeah. by 300 pound a month because that would cover the cost of GoPros or the lowest, the, the light version of GoPros as, as we had at the time for life. So if I could help you to increase your fees by 300 pound a month from existing clients for the same work that you're already doing, do you agree that the GoPros will upgrade or, or the light version, whichever way you look at it, is free for life? And they all said, yeah, I said, right. We're going to start next Saturday. I'll take the first 50 firms. Here we go. And um, they all, uh, we've got 50 firms signed up. We picked them. I remember stepping back thinking, shit, what am I going to do? With that? <laughs> How am I going to get to do this? At the moment, at the time of me booking that, I had no idea what I was going to say to them, what I was going to coach them in, how I was going to get them there. And then it forced me to do it. So I thought, right, well, what if I had to get this right, what I do? I'd have to get them into an abundant mindset to start with. I think that's the issue that's there. Then I'm going to have to put some structure in place. So all I actually knew by the first session was I had to create this abundance mindset training video, uh, tr training plan, and then have a headlines for the next month as to what I was actually going to do with them. And it forced it to happen. And that abundance mindset video that I did, I still... I think it's still set to private. We share, unlisted, we share with people if they ask for it or with certain people. I've had people come to me with that and tell me the impact that's had on them, right? It was a forced video. I, I had a week to figure out what the hell I was going to say on that video. At the end of that month, those 50 firms <clears throat> had increased their revenue by over half a million pound, collective revenue by over half a million pound. On average, 830 pound a month fee increase from existing clients. We thought we'd fluked it, repeated it again the following two months later, and we got the same numbers out of it again. And then that created the momentum to write the book Untapped, which became an audio book, which we then did courses on and, and so much stuff and has, has benefited so many people, all because I took the first step of saying, guys, next week we're doing the webinar. No idea what I was going to do at that point. What most people would do is they would um, they'd wait and plan it and practice it and then announce it and you've lost six months you've lost the entire momentum motivation you need the motivation and motivation comes from the latin motivus which just means to move all you have to do is move and that in turn will start the momentum i do this myself i was thinking about this the other day it's quite psychopathic i think what i do let's say i was i had to paint the house okay and i had to paint three rooms and i, I finished painting one of the rooms Okay, so I've done everything. The woodwork, my cutting in is beautiful. All the walls are emulsion. And I finished that room. Most people would step back and look at that room and marvel at what they've done. What I will do is the moment I've done that, I will go and get the paint for the next room with a paintbrush, stick it in and just do one swipe across the wall, right? Just to start the next room, okay? So I'm, I don't, I will, for a moment, I will look at it. I'll look at the room but then I will immediately create pain toward, on the next step. Now I can't not not continue with that next room, okay? And it's like, it, then the moment you do it, you think, shit, when am I gonna get time to paint it? I've got, I'm doing this, this, week. right, okay. I'm gonna have to do this, I'm gonna have to do that. But you force it, the paint stroke on the next wall is the, or pulling a strip of wallpaper off or whatever, is the equivalent of sending the email to the client and saying, I need to have a meeting with you by the end of next week, okay? And at that point, I've been no idea how you're going to do it. You'll figure it out. You should always set a goal that's beyond your current capabilities. Me saying I need to meet you next week is a goal that's at the moment of me setting it is currently beyond my capabilities. I've now got a week to figure it out. 
And there is nothing like a deadline in a diary to force you to do the right thing. Thank you, James. Thank you so much for getting firm up season one off the ground, for spending so much time with us, giving so much value to accountant. Thank you for creating a product and education in an industry that I think really needed it and still do and still will continue to. And I know how many lives you've changed, including mine. <laughs> Getting emotional now. I know how many lives you've changed, including mine over the last five years. Everyone in this room, everyone listening to Fermont, you will have massively propelled how they feel about themselves. I heard a call on your phone from Kieran Phelan, one of the greatest Go Proposal legends, who called you up to speak to you and say to have a great Christmas, but just he was telling you how much of an impact you've had on his life and will continue to. And we're in this room with our video editor, with our marketing coordinator, and for everyone in the Go Proposal team, you've just created this platform. You were the person who grabbed us all from a very junior stage in our career and you just believed in us. And you just plied us with the skills and the belief that we can do anything. And every single one of us will have an amazing career and we will be filled with love in work because of what you did. So thank you. <laughs> Believe I crying as well. <laughs> We're all in bits. Thank you. <laughs>